Welcome to Let's Talk Sarcoidosis on the Road. Today's show is about a present day medical David and Goliath. I had the privilege of interviewing world renowned number one expert in the field of pulmonary sarcoidosis and chronic illness, Dr. Mark Judson in Albany, New York. A graduate from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, Dr. Mark Judson garners more than 30 years of medical practice. He is a professor of medicine and chief in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Albany Medical Center. This present day, David has passionately dedicated his life to defeating and slaying sarcoidosis. Dr. Judson has a burning passion for his patients, which is easily felt. His passion and desire had led him to uncover and discover more effective ways to bring a better quality of life to all patients, as well as bringing the medical community closer to defeating sarcoidosis. One of the ways he has accomplished this is by publishing more than 100 articles on sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is a chronic disease that can affect every organ in the body, such as eyes, skin, heart, and lungs, just to name a few. Sarcoidosis is created by a buildup of immune system cells in that particular organ forming small clusters called granulomas, which inflames that organ. Dr. Judson breaks down this process in layman's terms and share its effects, signs, the treatment, and more. Granulomas are basically white blood cells that should have been in the blood vessels, but they left and deposited in these balls in various tissues. And when they deposit in the lung, you get these balls of white cells in your lung, and it can cause you to cough or be short of breath or wheeze. When you get these granulomas or balls of white blood cells in your skin, they can cause a skin lesion. When they occur in the eye, they can cause eye disease, uh, vision problems, red eye, painful eye. Why? Do these white blood cells leave the blood vessels and go into these places? We don't know. Now, when these granulomas form from sarcoidosis, they can sometimes cause no problems, and sometimes they need no treatment. But on other times, they can accumulate to such a degree that the patient can really be functionally impaired, impair their quality of life, and on rare occasions, it can even be life-threatening. That's scary. Is it global, just in, uh, in the States? It's global. Okay. It's all over the world. You really can't find a place where there's no sarcoidosis. All ethnic groups, races, both sexes, people of all ages. So Dr. Judson, who is at most risk with this disease? Uh, or who is most at yes, risk? Yes, yes. Um, it's a little more common in women than men. Mm -hmm. It's more common in black than white people. Mm -hmm. It's more common the farther you are away from the, new, uh, the equator. It's more common in Northern Europe than Southern Europe, Northern Japan than Southern Japan. Uh, it's more common if, it's more common in relatives of people who have sarcoidosis. So if you have sarcoidosis, it's a little more likely that one of your relatives will have sarcoidosis. So speaking about that, can we talk about some of the signs, like the common signs of sarcoidosis? Yes, and you know that's kind of difficult, Dorothea, because, mm -hmm. because these granulomas from sarcoidosis can occur in any organ, really any symptom could possibly be related to sarcoidosis, and that's why it's often not diagnosed for months to years. And I'm sure several of the patients out there know that, that they've had symptoms for months or years before it was finally diagnosed. When it occurs in the lung, they can get coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. When it occurs in the skin, they can have a skin lesion. If it occurs uh, in the heart, they can have a heart rhythm disturbance. Oh, that's a little scary. <laughs> so how is, it, how is it diagnosed? Because that's one of the yeah. issues that a lot of the patients 
discuss is about diagnosis. Right. Um, usually to diagnose it, you need to do a biopsy of a tissue where those granulomas are, and actually biopsy that granuloma. Mm -hmm. You biopsy some tissue, then a doctor looks in a microscope and sees those balls of white cells, sees those granulomas. That's usually how the diagnosis is made. Sometimes it can be diagnosed without a biopsy, but usually 80, 90 percent of the time you need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And I wanted to go back about, about the uh, factors I wanted to ask you. Are the factors, um, they increase someone's risk of getting sarcoidosis, you know, based on, I guess, research? Yes, there are, a lot of these uh, factors have been studied in what we call epidemiology, mm -hmm. which means basically we try to do statistical analyses of what people are exposed to and figure out which statistically are likely to be associated with sarcoidosis. And we found some interesting things. One thing, for example, we found is that photocopier exposure, exposure to photocopier toner, is actually associated with sarcoidosis. Other conditions have been associated with it, such as um, firefighting. Firefighters have a higher rate of sarcoidosis. Hairdressers have a slightly higher rate of sarcoidosis. So all these associations have been made um, by some statistical analyses. Wow, that's interesting. I've never heard of that. I've heard of the firefighters, but not the other examples that you gave. Uh, once the patient, um, what can they expect from the doctors? Like, so when you have sarcoidosis, what exactly can us as patients expect from you as physicians? The doctor first has to figure out where is the sarcoidosis in the person's body. Is it in one place? Is it in several places? They then have to figure out, is it there but not causing any problems? Because as I said, these granulomas don't necessarily cause any problems. And the treatment of sarcoidosis, there are many treatments, but the primary treatment is steroids, such as prednisone, and that medicine has a lot of side effects. Uh, sometimes it's a necessary evil. Sometimes it really helps get rid of these granulomas, but it can cause so many side effects that when the sarcoidosis isn't causing a problem, it's best really to, to hold off on the therapy. So the doctor first has to determine where the sarcoidosis is. And the doctor is trying to figure out if the person needs treatment, uh, and if not, they need to be monitored closely over time to make sure they don't develop uh, worsening granulomas that does eventually need treatment. So will the treatment affect their quality of life? Hopefully, the treatment will improve their quality of life by melting away these granulomas. But sometimes the treatment can actually worsen the quality of life because of all the side effects that steroids can possibly uh, cause. Is there a cure for sarcoidosis? This is a big one. This is, this is the big one. Yes. And um, there is no cure in the sense that none of these medicines can make sarcoidosis permanently go away. Now, I have to be very careful. It usually does permanently go away in most cases, not all. It's usually not lifelong. It usually can last months to years. Sometimes it's lifelong. These medicines, though, have not, cannot control that. They can't control how long the disease is going to last. But the medicines can put it in remission. They can calm it down and make it go away while you're on the medicines. But they can't permanently end it. It seems to permanently end on its own. Wow. Now, uh, do sarcoidosis patients uh, suffer from Andorra symptoms? Definitely. And uh, there are several of them. The major one, I would say, is fatigue. Yes. Fatigue is an underappreciated problem in sarcoidosis. It's only in the last 10 years that really sarcoidosis doctors have focused on fatigue. Mm -hmm. But it's a major problem for patients. I've heard numerous patients say that their spouses don't understand, their employers don't understand, their friends don't understand. They're constantly told, you look fine. You know, snap out of it. What's, yeah. what's wrong with you? But they're, they're experiencing a lot of fatigue. And there are a lot of causes of that fatigue. One of them is that these, again, going back to these white blood cells, these granulomas, they produce a chemical or chemicals which it's not been proven, but we think that some of these chemicals do cause very significant fatigue. What about depression? I mean, is it most likely that patients will also suffer from depression? There's a lot of research showing that sarcoidosis patients do have high rates of depression. 
And this may be directly from sarcoidosis or the fact that they have a chronic disease, but it's real. A lot of them have depression. Now, how have the treatment options uh, changed since the first sight of seeing sarcoidosis? Uh, initially, the treatment was steroids. Mm -hmm. That was the major treatment, and it still is the major treatment today because it works most reliably. But because of all the side effects from steroids, over the last 10 to 20 years, a lot of other drugs have been developed and studied to try to take the place of steroids or to allow us to reduce the dose of steroids. And there are several such drugs available today. Now, I know you get a lot of questions uh, from your patients, so if you can share with the viewers, Dr. Jackson, what are some of the most common questions? A common one is, are my kids going to get this? And um, the odds of a sarcoidosis patient having a child with sarcoidosis ranges from about 1 in 6 to 1 in 20. So the, the, there is a significant odds they may get it, but the odds are they won't. Then they often ask, well, can I test my child to see if they have it? The answer to that is no, because sarcoidosis usually doesn't come on until the 20s or 30s. Sometimes it occurs at a very young age, but usually at least in the late teens to 20s. So there's no test that would be reliable in a child. Another question that's often asked is, um, um, am I going to live? And uh, the answer to that, only the guy upstairs knows the answer to that, but most patients do live with sarcoidosis. It's usually not life-threatening. There are some forms that are. Uh, heart sarcoid is usually not life-threatening, but can be. And very severe lung fibrosis cases can be. Patients with pulmonary hypertension, where their blood pressure is high in the blood vessels of their lung, that's called pulmonary hypertension, they are at um, some risk of, pot, of it being life-threatening. But uh, one of the reasons I am like sarcoidosis, I'm interested in sarcoidosis, is that the patients tend to do well in general. Usually it is not a fatal disease in more than 95% of cases. Wow, that's, a, that's good to know. Geez, that, you know, I think about myself when you're talking about these statistics. Now, we got through that. You're the chief division of pulmonary and critical care medicine uh, right here at Albany Medical right, Center, right. Uh, which is, again, beautiful. What sets Albany Medical Center apart in the treatment for sarcoidosis? I think that we have uh, a wide range of specialists with an interest in sarcoidosis. Uh, one of the things about having a sarcoidosis center is one person can't do it alone. The disease affects every organ in the body. I need an ophthalmology, an eye expert, to deal with those problems. I need a cardiologist, a heart expert, to deal with the heart problems of sarcoidosis. I need a dermatologist to deal with the skin problems of sarcoidosis. So to have a sarcoidosis center, you need a multi-specialty team of experts that know about different organs of the body and parts of the body to work with me to take care of the patients optimally with sarcoidosis. And that's great because everyone knows what the other doctor is doing. Right. So you guys work as a team. Right. And it's important, I'm sure, to have a team when you're having patients with this disease. Absolutely. You were recently ranked by Expertscape as the number one expert in the world on sarcoidosis and pulmonary sarcoidosis based on the number of research articles that you published in a medical journal over the past decade. What are some of the advantages of the type of clinical research that you do? Well, I think that it all comes down to patients. At the end of the day, um, we're trying to take care of sarcoidosis patients. So a lot of what we do is clinical research involving the patients. We're doing research with drugs to see if we can help cure the sarcoidosis or lessen the sarcoidosis. We're doing research on quality of life to see if we can improve that. But most of our focus here is clinical research with patients. Okay, has your research focused on a particular aspect of sarcoidosis? We've done studies on skin sarcoidosis, lung sarcoidosis, heart sarcoidosis, a lot of studies on fatigue and quality of life in sarcoidosis. We've done studies looking at the effect of steroids on sarcoidosis, both positive and how they help the patient, 
and negative on how the side effects can worsen the patient's quality of life. Oh, that's a lot of great research. Um, has your re the other thing is, have there been any breakthroughs? Because a lot of people want to know that about this you know, disease and understanding the causes and new medications or possible cure. There have been new medications, as I mentioned, several in the last five mm -hmm. or ten years that have really been breakthrough medications, mm -hmm. which have lessened the need for the steroids. Uh, and there has been really important research done in the last five or ten years on getting down to what's going on in the white cell, what's going on to cause sarcoidosis. We're not quite there yet, but we've made major strides in the last uh, decade in that area. And it's really good to hear. So what do you think, Dr. Judson, the future holds for sarcoidosis research and patients? And can you envision a day when sarcoidosis is just completely eliminated? This is what we're all, we're all shooting for, and I think it will happen uh, someday. I think one thing that we are also trying to do over the next five or ten years is a, a personalized medicine. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. And we're trying to develop therapies which work in individual patients. Because the therapy might work in a group of patients, but not in individual ones. You know? So we're trying to individualize or personalize uh, medical therapy, and I think we're making strides in that area as well. Well, that's great news. I'm glad to hear that. Now, before I end the show, I would like to know, is there anything that you would say to our audience about this disease, what they should know about sarcoidosis? Um, I would just tell the audience that there are a lot of very bright people working very, very hard on this disease. And um, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're trying. And the other thing I would say, and being involved in a lot of support groups, as I know you are, Dorothea, yes. is that to realize you're not alone. Sometimes you go to the doctor's office and you're in the room and you walk out. You're not alone. There are a lot of sarcoidosis patients out there. I encourage you to if there's a support group near you, to get involved. Uh, and together, I think we can, uh, we can cure this thing. Wow, that's awesome. Dr. Judson, I want to thank you again for your time, your expertise, for lending it to the viewers out there and letting us come up and film the Let's Talk Sarcoidosis on the Road show so we can continue to go on the road globally and bring stories to our viewers to help save lives. Thank you so much again. And as I always say, living with this illness, stay positive, always live your life, do the best that you can, uh, that you can do for the quality of your life, and please, no stress. Thanks for watching Let's Talk Sarcoidosis on the Road, and we'll be coming to a city or country near you.